When we're talking about e-commerce businesses, of course, we're talking about companies that sell products online. That's what we think of typically, which from the accounting side of things means we're going to be focused on tracking and managing inventory for your e-commerce company. That's really the crux of what the challenge is in terms of the accounting. It's tracking all of it, and especially because in most e-commerce cases, you have sales happening on different sales channels. We sell on Amazon. We sell on our website. We might sell on eBay, Walmart, Groupon. There's a million places where you can be selling your products online. And if you read the write-up, you'll see my commentary on why I feel it's important to sell on more places than just Amazon. But for now, I want to focus on the actual accounting which means I want to walk you through QuickBooks Online Advanced and how inventory works in QuickBooks Online Advanced. First thing I want to do is bust the myth that QuickBooks Online can't handle inventory. If somebody tells you that, it means they haven't looked at QuickBooks Online in probably well over five years. It handles it and it handles it well. Um, and it's important also, I think, to understand how the inventory valuation is calculated. So that's what I want to walk through here actually. We're going to record these three purchases of inventory. We're going to create a generic item here called something I sell. And we're going to purchase it in three different lots because QuickBooks Online calculates your inventory on what's called a first in first out basis. When you run reports to show the inventory valuation, you'll see the cost averaged per unit. But when it calculates the actual cost goods sold on a sale, it actually calculates it based on first in first out. So I'm going to show you exactly what that means and how that works so that it's really clear when you're running your inventory reports in QuickBooks Online, exactly how your inventory valuation is calculated, um, especially on the actual sale of your products. Okay, so first let's go in and we're going to record some bills. All right, and I don't even know what I have in here for vendors. Let's just call it I supply. Okay, just quickly add. I don't need any details on that. And I'm just going to enter these purchases in exactly where I've got them laid out. So January 15th, 2019. I don't care about the due dates or any of that stuff. Um, and then notice here, we're in the category details. This is often where we go to enter information on a bill. But since we're purchasing products, we need to go down here to the item details. And it may be a little bit subtle to the eye, especially if you're not used to this screen. So this is what you want to look for. And look for this little right pointing arrow. That means it's currently zipped up. When you click on it, it will expand, and now we can actually enter our products, right? So we're going to take a product called Something I Sell. I'm going to set it up real quick. When you're setting up a new product uh, inventory part, especially in QuickBooks Online, you're going to set it up as inventory, right? Uh, important, by the way, a little side note. I didn't touch on this at all in the write-up. When you're setting up your SKUs, a uh, really good tip here is to make sure that the SKU is at least three letters long. The reason being that when you're in third-party apps, which you're almost going to have to be to manage the process of getting sales from the sales channel into QuickBooks Online, if you're looking up a product by SKU, uh, the third-party apps that I've used are going to require at least three letters in order for it to find it in a list of products. So use the SKU and make sure that it's at least three letters. Okay. Um, when we're setting up a new product, we have to put an initial quantity on hand. I always put zero in there because we're going to record the purchase. The as of date, it wants you to uh, put in an as of date, meaning this is the first date on which I started carrying this inventory. Be careful with this one. I've gotten myself sort of tripped up by putting in the date that I'm, let's say, entering this bill or maybe the date of the bill. And then later on, I go and realize that there's an older bill that I have to enter. <clears throat> And it won't let me do it because I've established the as of date as something subsequent to that. So what I do is I backdate this, usually by a lot. So if we're in 2019 and I know the bill I'm about to enter is from January of this year, let's just go 010118. And this, this way I know for sure I'm not going to be entering any inventory transactions prior to that date. So this won't create any friction for me. But it is required. You have to put something there. So that's why I wanted to really stress this. You can put a quantity that serves as a reorder point, And then there are reports you can run so that you can see which products it's time to reorder uh, if that's how you manage it. I personally, as an accountant, don't love using this because I feel that the reorder point should change based on where we are in the year. Most product-based businesses are cyclical in nature, which means I don't want to go by a static number as a reorder point. I want to go by a combination of a number based on where in the year we are. 
right? So that's why I usually leave this blank, but you're certainly welcome to use it. It definitely can be useful in some cases. We'll stick with the generic sales of product income account and a generic expense account on the uh, cost of goods sold size. This you're almost never going to want to mess with. You, have, you, know, you should have a really good reason for using more than one cost of goods sold account for the products you sell, um, at least insofar as what you're tying the actual product into. There are going to be other cost of goods sold account types for things like shipping, logistics, that sort of stuff. Um, now, I've got my product set up. I won't have to do that again. All right. So we're selling, we're buying a quantity of 100. Okay, we're buying them for a unit price of $25 a piece, which gets us our amount of $2,500. Now, if you're ever buying uh, inventory that you know exactly what customer you're selling it to, you can assign it to the customer here. Um, but most of the time when we're buying inventory, we're, buying, we're stocking up. We have no idea who's going to be buying that inventory. Um, but just know that that option is there in case you need it. All right, I'm going to say save and new because I want to get these other bills entered. Okay, next one is going to be on February 5th. And it's going to be also from iSupply. And we're going to go right down here to the item details. It remembers the last transaction, which makes it nice and easy because now all I have to do is change the quantity. And notice we're buying it at a different unit price, right? It's almost like we're saying, hey, the, um, the supplier gave us a discount, so we wanted to stock up on some more of them. Right, there's my $4,000, save and new. And then on 319, we're going to purchase another 50 of them for a higher price. All right, down here, something I sell. 50 at 30 or 1500, just double check. All right, now I'm going to say save and close. Okay, let's run a report. I like using the search because it's a lot faster if I know what I'm looking for. If you type inventory, you'll see the inventory reports that you can run pretty much in a pinch here. So let's look at the valuation uh, summary. Right, so there it is, $8,000, and that checks out with what I've got here. What I did here was I just calculated the average cost of the inventory um, because there are reports I can run, and here it shows me calculated average 22.857. Survey says... 22.86. They just used more decimals than I've got. Um, so that checks out as well. Now, if I go back to reports and I look at inventory valuation detail. And let's run it for all dates. Okay, now it actually shows you the details. It shows you the, each of the different purchase points. We had the starting value that it created as of 1118. Remember when I was setting that up? Then we have the January 15th purchase. The it has each of the purchases, each of the bills that have entered. So you can see the quantity and the rate. And the, here's the FIFO cost. And that's what I was, the FIFO stands for first in, first out, right? So this shows you what the FIFO cost is. And we're going to go back to this report in a minute because now what I want to do is I want to record some sales and I want to show you exactly what I'm talking about here in terms of what that means when I'm selling at FIFO. So let's record the sale. Let's say on April, let's say I stocked up on this inventory the first three months of the year. Now it's uh, April 15th. Right, and now we're going to have a sale. But let's say I want to sell, I've, I've sold 150 of these, right? And I'm trying to calculate the cost of that inventory that sold. Well, I can't do 150 at 25 because I've only got 100 at 25. So in order to look at this properly, I've got to break it up to 100 and then separately 50, right? Same sale. 100 of these I sold at $25 a piece cost. Right? It's not what I sold it for, it's what it cost me. I want to make sure we're clear about that. And then the other 50 get sold out of the next lot. Right, I've sold through the entire 25 here, and I'm selling 50 of these at $20. Right, So the true cost of goods sold on that sale is going to be $3,500. Let's get these all formatted to look like numbers. And let's see if I'm wrong, which means the remaining cost on hand should be the difference or 8,000 minus 3,500. Remember, we're not, I don't care what we sold it for, for today's purposes, right? I'm only looking at our costs, right? This is the cost that moves out of the inventory that we had on hand and into cost gets sold when we record these, this sale. So let's record the sale. I'll go to the plus sign. We'll go to an invoice. 
and then I'll add some customer. Okay. April 15th. Now here I can put the whole 150. What I'm showing you here is what the calculation is that goes on in the background. You don't have to know this for this purpose. You know, and the rate we're putting here, again, is not the cost. It's what we're selling it for. So let's just say if my average cost was 2286, hopefully I'm selling these for at least 50 bucks a piece, right? Let's just call it that. Again, I don't care about this. This is irrelevant for this discussion. I want to make sure we're clear that we're staying focused on talking about what the inventory costs us. What did I do wrong? Oh. It's looking for an email because I didn't uncheck send later. Okay, now we're going to go back and look at some reports. Remember what I calculated here, cost gets sold $3,500. First of all, <clears throat> let's go back into the invoice. One way I love checking my work in QuickBooks Online is that I can always go to the transaction, in this case the invoice, and go to more and go to the transaction journal. This will give me the debits and credits behind the scenes of that transaction. Okay, so here we have the entire account receivable, the entire amount of the invoice was $7,500. Notice what it's doing. It's doing it exactly as I did it here. It's breaking it up. It's showing a credit to inventory reduces the value of inventory. It's got my 1000 and my 2500 right? This credit of 7500 is the offset to accounts receivable. This is the total of what I sold the products for. So these are coming out of inventory, and they're going into cost of goods sold. Right? So here you can see very clearly how QuickBooks Online Advance is actually breaking up the cost of goods sold exactly the way I described, first in, first out basis. That's how it calculates the inventory. Let's run a quick profit and loss because that gives us kind of the summary version of what you see going on there. And since this is the only transaction recorded on this entire set of books, it will be really clear. So there's my total sales of product income and there's my cost of goods sold, survey said. 3,500, uh, that's the subtotal that I'm looking for. And this was cost of goods sold remaining. Right, and let's check that part of the math out um, by running a balance sheet. Survey says inventory asset, 4,500. Right, 4,500 cost goods sold remaining. It's simple math now. 8,000 minus what I sold of 3,500 equals the 4,500. Right, and there it is there. So that, my friends, is your quick sort of deep dive on how inventory works in QuickBooks Online. What you've also seen here is how to set up an inventory item, how to record its purchase and how to record its sale. That's pretty much the entire inventory cycle. Of course, very simple, only using one product. It only gets infinitely more complex when you have more products, but that's all it does. Everything sort of still fits inside of what I've just laid out for you. You'll just have more products and more transactions to record. But if you can understand this, in fact, what I would recommend you do is open up a blank QuickBooks Online Advanced company, or even go into the QuickBooks Online Advanced test drive, which if you Google that, you should be able to find links to it, I believe, at this point on Google. Um, and you can go in and it's a sample company you can play with and you can kind of enter the same transactions uh, that I've walked through here and see if you don't get the exact same results in terms of your debits and credits and the inventory valuation reports. And let's just look at that one last time because I did promise you I would go back to that. The inventory valuation detail now, right, for all dates. And now it's going to show you, in addition to what we saw before with the bills, it shows you the invoices. It shows you we sold 150 at 25 and 50 at 20, at cost of 25 and cost of 20, right? So again, you can see yet another way. I just kind of sliced this up a few different ways, but you can see it very clearly looking at this report that it's calculating it exactly the way I laid out that it would calculate it right here in my spreadsheet. And it's not a bad idea if you're really trying to learn and understand this stuff to lay it out like I did in a spreadsheet, calculate what you think it's going to come up with enter the transactions and see if it doesn't get the same result. If it doesn't get the same result, then you've missed something somewhere. Go back, review what you did. By the time you figure out where you went wrong, you'll definitely have a solid understanding of everything I'm showing you and talking about here. And that's the best way to learn this stuff. So anyway, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, or feedback, or you just want to tell me that you thought this was wonderful, I'm pretty easy to find on the internet. My name is Seth David. My company is Nerd Enterprises, and I look forward to seeing you on the web.